All right, everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of Logic Live. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, who sent uh, just messages of support. We I really appreciate it. We all really appreciate it. Uh, a lot goes into putting these together, and uh, it just really uh, meant a lot to get the support and also hear like how much um, you're all enjoying these. And so thank you very much for that. Uh, this is the, uh, hey, Dan. This is uh, the first one of uh, the Logic Labs we're doing with the uh, webinar format. So if you look in the control, uh, the, the control strip with the, uh, for the Zoom, the buttons, you'll see a Q&A button. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A button or in the Q&A panel. Uh, and what's great is they'll stay in there until they're answered. Uh, it'll just make it easier to find them as opposed to uh, scrolling up through the chat. All right, we'll still keep an eye on the chat, but if you have a question, throw it in Q&A. Uh, so let's get started here. Welcome to uh, writing Python scripts for Flame with myself and Fred. This episode of Logic Live is brought to you by Synesis Oceana. Synesis Oceana provides solutions and uh, to teams. Uh, I'm sorry, let's try that again. <laughs> Take two. Synesis Oceana provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. They've been my, uh, my uh, reseller for about 15 years. I couldn't do my job without them. Uh, they keep us going on both coasts. And uh, they've always been supporters of the Flame community. They sponsor uh, user groups in um, New York, Toronto, uh, Detroit, Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, and I'm sure more. And uh, they've always provided gifts uh, or prizes rather for the, uh, for the One Frame of White contest, including two fabulous ice sculptures in Las Vegas. And uh, we will be back. I can't wait. So but to find out more about their remote workflow solutions, go to Synesis.io, Synesis Oceana, supporting flame artists since 1997. All right, we're gonna dive right in here. Let me stop this share and, uh, and say uh, welcome to uh, writing Python scripts for flame. Um, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna, th this, this presentation today is really designed for like the absolute beginner to the aspiring or maybe enthusiastic uh, intermediate. But I got interested in uh, writing Python scripts for Flame, um, I guess about a year and a little more than a year ago, year and a year and a half ago. Um, you know, at work where uh, I was always like coming up against the constant pressures, like the downward pressures of time and uh, budget, of course. And so I started to look at all the things I was doing repetitively and was curious to see if there was some way to automate these, to make the workflow more efficient, to make my time uh, more efficient and more, more profitable, um, which maybe is more important now than ever. So I sat down with, uh, with uh, the Flame documentation, with Grant Kay's uh, learning channel tutorials on Python, with um, anything I could Google for Python, and, uh, and also with the help of a, a, a wonderful human being who I'm going to introduce in a moment, um, I started down this, this exciting journey. So let me uh, just show you all a little bit of what's possible with the Flame Python API. Um, and then we'll uh, look at how you, not only how you write your first script, but um, what some of the uh, important things you need to know about Python are in order to really dive in. So uh, let me share the old screen one more time. All right, and the very important thing for Mac, um, you want to start Flame or Flare or whatever uh, app you're using, you want to start it from the terminal because that'll give you the same kind of console feedback that you get in Linux, okay? Um, when you do run a, a Python script, it's possible to get feedback in this window, either intentionally, like if you would like to see something in there, or unintentionally, like if something isn't working, this is where you're gonna, you're gonna where Flame's gonna tell you, hey, and you've, you know, you've, you've forgot to indent something properly again. Um, more on that, I promise you, <laughs> as we dive in. So you just navigate to uh, your, your Linux, or your Flame directory, rather, which in my case is opt, Autodesk, Flame 2021, and then bin, all right? And once you're in the bin directory, it's dot slash start application. This works on Linux as well, but you get the console for free. So this will now do its thing. It'll preserve a bunch of stuff. And here we go.
Wonderful. All right, so let me open up a little desktop here. And uh, the Python commands or the Python scripts you have installed are all um, visible or um, you activate them from the contextual menu from the right click, okay? And uh, yes, I'm broadcasting a 239, Gabriel, because I am the uh, proud owner of one of these ultra-wide monitors, which has been life-changing. Um, apologies to everyone at home. <laughs> Wait, I'm broadcasting a 239, but it's not anamorphic, okay? Because we all hate anamorphic. Thank you. All right, so let me show you some of the things that you can do. Uh, for example, like whenever I would make a batch group, add a batch group in Flame, I'd always have to call it whatever I call it. You know, this is scene one. And then I would always go through and I would name the schematic reels, you know, what I kind of always name schematic reels, uh, source, ref. We all have our own formula and that's fine. Three comps. And then I would add another one, you know, for notes. I had a whole system, I've been building this for years. Okay. Uh, so I went ahead and modified one of the example Python scripts that you get with the Flame documentation to uh, create a script that's called create new batch group. So when I click on that, I get a new batch group with a default name, right? It can be whatever you want. And then look, here's a batch group with the four um, schematic reels the way that I like them. And I don't know if you caught this, but every Python script um, that you install can have a hotkey assigned to it. So here I have a very, actually, this is not only a hotkey to uh, launch or to create a new batch group. This is the name of Elon Musk's new kid, I think, if I, uh, if I remember what I read online. So it's control option command, I think, control option command A. So if I were to do that, thank you, Kego. I appreciate that. Boom, there you go, you get another one. All right, so any one of these scripts, you can uh, do keyboard shortcuts. Um, well, Christopher, uh, I can tell you right now, we have the, the very person to uh, bring that up to, uh, coming live to us here on, on, uh, on Logic Live. Um, but let's see what else, what other kind of things we can do. Um, I have here a spot, or at least a, a dummy spot, right? It's, a, it's a, uh, a slate, and then I have the spot here. And I know everyone here loves Extreme Reach. I, uh, I, uh, I, I know that that's a long list of people who love Extreme Reach, but uh, Extreme Reach requires you to export with a certain number of, of uh, frames uh, of slate and a certain number of frames of black at the tail. I kept screwing that up. So I wrote a little Python script for the timeline here that allows me to set Extreme Reach in and out points on my clip, okay? And then when I go to export that here, I have a script called Extreme Reach Export. And when I uh, pick that, it points to a directory by default, and it won't work because I have this preset here <laughs> from, uh, from an older version. But basically, it will um, export um, the, it will, I have it automatically set to export this QuickTime and respect the in and out points, or this clip and respect the in and out points, which is what um, Extreme Reach is going to want. But let me show you something that I did actually test before we started today. And that was um, anybody here who's ever done uh, any type of like episodic work, you're, we have clients who anytime we need to post something, it needs to be posted with two different codecs. One of the codecs, uh, uh, you know, in this case, one of our episodic clients wanted uh, DNX 36 and DNX 145 um, QuickTimes. And they wanted the DNX 36 QuickTimes in a folder called DNX 36. And they wanted the DNX 145 code quick times to be in a DNX, uh, I guess 115 really is what they wanted, a folder. And they wanted it to have an underscore HQ at the end of the name. So I uh, wrote a little script here that we'll show you later that will automatically export any selected clip using two export presets. And if I go to the media hub here and just navigate to my desktop, da da da. And of course, give Wiretap Gateway permission to do all this. Exports. I have a dated folder for today. And then here's DNX 36 with the export. And then a DNX 115 with the export underscore HQ. Okay? Little things like that. Um, every time we uh, start a project here uh, at Lively where I work, um, I make an import folder or an import library rather that contains all the things I import like uh, audio files or things from design or things from um, uh, our CG department. So I have a script here that says create import library, all right? 
and that, boom, creates an import library with anything that I would want. And uh, one of the first scripts that, uh, that I, I wrote that I was helped with by our, our lovely guest today was the create a shared library script, which will give you a dialog box that allows you to enter the artist's name, right? And then you're gonna get a shared library with that artist's name and then folders called to and from, all right? Again, things that you do every day, a million times a day, can then go ahead and be automated. And the last thing I'll show you before we move on is in batch. Um, I have here like the, uh, the very basic kind of setup that you get when you um, uh, do a create batch group from the timeline. So I have here a clip and I have uh, a work picture and a render node. And um, just so you can see here, I can right click on the clip and I have uh, options like I can add an action node here if I want to, right? And then, or to this clip here, I could also add a mux node and automatically freeze it if I want, right? And that'll happen at whatever frame I'm at. All right, that's labeled with the right number name. I can select a bunch of things if I want and I can right click on there and encompass them, right? And give the compass a name all automatically. And again, you can assign keyboard shortcuts to all of these things. Um, or you can do what uh, uh, what I always what I love to do. You know, every time we break out a spot and break out the shots, we have to prep for like a client session. You know, we, where we need to do red pen notes for cleanup, make notes for other artists or the artists that are helping us out. And so uh, I made a little script here where I can right click on any batch group, right, and create what I call my like just basic batch setup. Actually, hold on one second, let me open this up, make sure that the names are right. Here, first things first, let's name the reels with one script and do that with another script. And so what this does automatically, here are all the things that I would do for every single shot by hand. It adds a neat video OFX and it adds a write file node that has all the path and file format information baked in. It's got a paint here for red pen notes that has um, uh, my, a setup that, that also loads a paint setup that contains, I'm just cycling through here, one, two, three, four, um, some colors that I always use, right? For my uh, uh, presets and a freeze or whatever frame I happen to be on. Um, a little subtract here and then add to uh, subtract and add the, uh, the noise back on top. And then um, some resizes in between because uh, there are times where we work um, you know, if, if you have a client out there that shoots 8K and you're doing a Snapchat deliverable, there's really no reason to work in 8K. Uh, so I have a little part of the script here that will down res and then up res back to the source. And then, you know, an action and whatever else here to do in between. But all this was created at the touch of a button. If I had 50 shots, I could right click on all 50 batch groups and it would do this 50 times over. And then instead of taking an hour or so to prepare for your client or to prepare to start working, you're done in 10 seconds and there's an hour billable time that you got back. Um, and we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna dive into these, um, into these uh, Python scripts. All of your Python scripts uh, live in a folder. They live in a folder called opt Autodesk shared Python. And if I go to that folder here, anything you put in this folder will appear in flame when you right click. And just to show you like um, in this episodic exports, uh, folder or a script rather. There's a bunch of things here that we're going to go into detail on, but you know, every Python script for Flame starts with importing the Flame module, which has all the Flame Python commands for the Python API. And then you can see here, um, I'm calling uh, um, export presets that you just make in the export menu, right? I just point to where they are uh, on my either on my SAN or in this case on my local drive, okay? And then down at the bottom, of the script, you have, um, uh, I've come to call this bracket hell. I'm sure there's a better name for this, <laughs> but inside all of these little open and close brackets is where you uh, put a label, where you put the name for uh, the script that shows up when you right click. Um, and that is a very brief overview of what you can do with Python in Flame. And so uh, I wanna bring on now, uh, someone who uh, I've always respected, but has become in the course of my 
my Python journey here, uh, a, I would say a dear friend, who now is in the Fred, 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 He's a friend, he's on the phone. Fred, 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 he's a friend, he's on the phone. Fred, he's on the phone. Coming to you live from, uh, from Montreal is the lovely and talented Fred Warren. Fred, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Andy. Aha. Hello. How are you, Hello, man? everyone. I'm doing good. Thank you. So uh, I, I, uh, I set the stage here for you, man. We talked a little bit about Python and uh, showed some examples of what you can do in Flame. But uh, it's really important for everybody to understand this is a, a programming language. You do need to understand some foundational things in Python in order, in order to, to do this. So uh, Fred is going to take us through a little bit of, uh, of uh, well, I was going to say Python for dummies, but no, 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 no. It's Python for Andes. Let's do it, man. No, I, I would say, I, I'll, what I would call it is like, uh, you said it in your intro, right? It's Python for people who are curious about it and want kind of a starting point to actually dig into it and know where to start to actually use the Flame Python uh, API with Flame. So just like uh, what, you, what you did, uh, Andy. So I'm gonna share my desktop. Here we're gonna go in Flame and we're gonna bring the Python console. So uh, what I thought we would do is actually uh, go over the first example that you did. So you created a badge group with uh, your uh, custom action using Python API. And what I wanted to show is how you could actually reach a point where you could discover that by yourself, by testing things. And the best, the best tool that you can use to actually test the Flame Python API is the Python console within, within Flame. So you can open it from the Flame menu at the bottom there. So you go to the Python sub menu and you open the Python console. One thing to quickly mention is that Flame still uses a flavor of Python 2.7, okay? So it is not uh, using Python 3 yet. So there might be, if you look at online documentation, there might be some differences between uh, Python 2 and Python 3, so you need to make it. Uh, aware, you, may, you need to make sure that you are looking at example for Python 2. And also from one version to the other, we are increasing the amount of things that are possible in the API. So it's possible that if you look at a script that you were using uh, with uh, Flame 2021, and then you try to use it in Flame 2020.3, it might not use because the, la the, la the latter may, may not have the, uh, the component in the Python API that you are using. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna look at the media panel here. We are try to add a, a badge group like you did in D and make it red with this color coding. So the first thing that you need to do, as you mentioned, is to import the flame, uh, the flame module inside your console so you can use those controls. The first thing that, you, uh, that is a very good thing to use when you are actually discovering what you, you are trying to do is to use the print function, which will also always print in the console the, the objects that you're looking at or the uh, different uh, attributes. So we're gonna go over that. So the first thing we're gonna do is try to print what is a, the current workspace? And right away, you'll see that you will we'll get an error. And this is where, let me make that a little bit bigger here for you. And this is what's uh, really nice about the console is that you get instant feedback on the problems that you have that uh, do not work in your script. So in this example here, I can say that I made a typo. And if I rerun this again, using either on Linux, the control enter command or a shortcut or on Mac, the uh, command return. So you, we, you see that we're getting an object because Python is an object based language. So all that you are going to do here is actually uh, modify objects using different commands 
uh, different function and attributes. So my object is flame.projects.current project done current current workspace. So that's quite a long string. You don't want to type that every time. So we're gonna store it in a variable. So the variable can be any piece of text, any string that you want. So in my case here for workspace, I just uh, decided to use WS. So I'm gonna store the, that object in my WS variable. So now if I print WS, I'll get the same object as I add with when I use the proper object string from the API. So now that let's say you know which object you want to modify, you can always rely on things that are, that are available, that are normal, let's say to Python. So something like a doc string. So we're gonna print the doc string. So the underscore underscore doc underscore underscore for the object that we store, which is the work, workspace. And it says object representing a workspace in Flame. One of the things that is not available from Python, but from the Python API that you can use to actually have a look at what's possible is the dot attributes here. So we, if we print that property, you're gonna get a list of all the attributes that are uh, possible to a, either get or set for a given object. In that case, you see that list here that includes name. So if I print the name of my workspace, so it's always the object dot the attributes or dot the function. One trick to differentiate a attribute or properties from a function is that a function is something, always something that has parentheses. So if I print the, the name of my uh, workspace, I should have gotten, uh, uh, no, sorry, that, that's logic. I forgot to, to change the name, so we will we'll rename it uh, afterward. But I can, uh, since it's object-based, I can also define a variable for my attribute. So uh, using underscore name instead of name. So if I print my variable here, that's gonna give me again the same result. Now we're gonna rename that to, uh, let's say, logic. ND uh, because this one is always uh, is already named logic. So uh, here, what I did was to get the attributes. Now, what we're going to do is actually set it. So we're going to change it by saying the name equal a string and selected equal true. We're going to return that, and you can see that it says logic ND, and now it's the the entry that is selected. Uh, the one thing that is really, really, really useful that also is like a Python uh, uh, default function is help, where you can say, uh, give me the help of any object. So if we run this here in my console, I'll get all the different uh, methods, uh, attributes of this, also uh, what we call uh, read-only properties. So in that case here, I can see that, for example, a workspace contains a desktop and the libraries. So if I wanted to, let's say, store the workspace.desktop in a variable called desk, I would run this. And you can see just, the, just a, a thing that is a good practice is to always uh, print something to make sure that it was properly uh, set. Uh, and as Andy said, if you run it through custom actions, the print, you can still put it, the, the output will be in the console instead of, but the, the Mac terminal or the Linux console instead of in the Python console. We're gonna move to the list. So here, uh, now that you have seen that by going to the help of the workspace that there was something called desktop, you can could then say, Okay, then show me the help for the desk. Uh, is there something about batch groups in there? So you see the different functions and you see that yes, you have something that is batch groups, uh, that is a, a list there. And there's the function create batch group with all the documentation about it. So if you say, okay, I want to see the name of the batch groups and you run that, you'd get an error because 
uh, batch group in that case here is not a, a batch group object, it's a list of batch group. So if we type, so one of the things that you can use is the type here function. So if you run that, you see that it returns that this is a list. In the case of a list, you have multiple different objects. So if, for example, you want to print the name of the first batch group, you're gonna, you're gonna need a, a square bracket and give the index of the group. In Python, the index always starts at zero. So even if you say that's the first batch, that's the second batch, it always starts at zero. So we're gonna say print for the first one. And now it's gonna say batch. Uh, one thing that is really powerful, even for like uh, that beginner can use, are for loops. So a for loop is a, a loop in which you say for a, a variable. So in that case, you just give the name if you want. But since it's for all the batch groups and the batch group list, uh, we're going to say for a batch group in the list, print the batch group name. So you say for the variable in the list, execute that command. So if we do that, you see that both items, so it went, it got the first batch group, print it, then rerun the loop for the second batch group up until there are no more batch groups and do it. Uh, if, for example, we wanted to rename our batch group, then we could say, uh, define a, a uh, int here, okay, that is one, and say for the same loop, set the batch group name to logic, so a string, because in the case of the name, we need to pass a string as an argument. Uh, so logic plus the string of, uh, that, how, you, how you, I would say that is, uh, you turn the int, which is a number, so uh, not a float, in that case, a, a float would have like this small values, in that case, it's really an int. So you need to say, this is a, a number, but turn that into a string. So you can say logic one, logic two, and then at the end of that loop, you increase your variable by one. So if we run that, we're gonna have logic one and logic two. Then we move on to uh, functions. So as you saw in the help, we had the create batch group and you add like different things that you could set as argument. So in that case here, you see that I have my function, which is for my desktop, create a batch group. And the only thing that we're gonna do in that, in that case is give it a name. One of the most common error that you're gonna come across is that when you're trying to use a, a net tribute for um, in, a, in a define like in a function like this, you will need to set it to get value first uh, to be able to use it. So if sometimes it, the console will return that this attribute uh, is not callable, then it means that you need, the, you need to use the uh, get value let me just write it quickly like this. And then in that case here, we add the plus to create a space between uh, the name of the workspace and I've added a three like this. And then you can always print the attributes for the object that you have just created because instead of just creating it, we, creating it, we created it by already uh, storing it in a variable. So then it's easier for you to refer to the object that you have just created. And you are seeing uh, right away in the console uh, all the attributes for the new batch group, including color. So what we're gonna do is try to change the color of this batch group. So one thing to understand, when we set, when we set the name, it was between the qu quotation marks it's not always this kind of value that must be passed as an argument, right? So in that case here, you see that if I try to set it 
in between in quotation marks, uh, marks and gonna say that it doesn't work. So what you, what you can do, again, is use the type uh, function to see, and also the dot values. So dot values in that case here with the type will tell you that it's a tuple. And if we only uh, print them without the type, it's gonna give you the maximum and uh, the minimum and maximum values. So in the case of a tuple, you're gonna use parentheses as well. So the difference between a list and a tuple is that the list is between square bracket and can be modified. You can append items to a list, you can remove items from a list, where a tuple is also a list, but yet that you can only modify the values. You cannot modify the list itself. So if we run that again, you see that this has turned uh. Uh, red. So uh, that was it for my part in the console. So we're gonna move uh, quickly to uh, something about the Python hooks. So, um, uh, real quick though, does anybody have any questions? There were a couple that popped up in the Q and A, but uh, or, uh, they were about tokens, and we'll get to that later. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get to that before the end. But anything before Fred moves on from the console stuff? All right, onward. Okay, okay. So uh, there are different ways to execute Python comments in a, in a Flame. We basically showed you two already. So Andy showed you the uh, using a custom action. So by adding a piece of script in a file, that's gonna turn into a custom action in the contextual menu. So that's one uh, of the, the ways. I showed you from the Python console, okay? Uh, you can execute uh, stuff we just showed you. There's also a, a way if you want to um, always have something run when you start Flame, for example, you can use the start application command and pass it the uh, dash s argument with the name of a script. So when you are gonna launch the application, it will execute that script uh, on demand uh, at this very specific time. But there's also ways to actually execute Python commands every time an operation is, uh, is run. So this is using a Python hook. And I just tried to uh, illustrate very, very uh, basically uh, what is a Python hook. So imagine that you go in Flame, okay? and you can perform some operation. So you go to the batch tab, okay, that's, that's normal. You add the right file node to your, uh, to your uh, schematic and you attach it to a, a clip or a node, that's, uh, that's correct. And then you render, so to, uh, to able to uh, export the, the content of your right file node uh, on disk. What happens when you render is that there's a Python hook attached to that function that is already there in your files. So if you go to the application slash Python directory, there are uh, uh, various, um, uh, various uh, files, .py files there that contain hooks, for example, batch export n. The only difference from one user to the other is that if you do not like go and modify it, it will just pass and nothing will happen when you will render. But for some people, you can go and actually put some code in there that will do something when you render. So if we go to uh, my editor here and we look at the uh, batch hook.py, okay, you're gonna see that when the batch export begin, it's set to pass, so by default, nothing will happen, but I've modified the batch export end, so when we're done rendering the, the, the frames, what we're doing here is we're storing the path of the clip that we have exported, and right away after, we are re-importing it in Flame uh, using the dot import clip function, and we're adding it to the schematic renders. So if we go to batch and have a look at this, 
here. So I have my little image here, my right file. I'm exporting to my uh, var temp export here, final version, of course. We, we render it. On disk, I actually got my render, right? So if we go here and look, you see that my final version EXR was rendered. But what happened is that a clip was also added to my schematic in my schematic renders here because of the hook that I had set. So if there's something that you always want to, uh, to be run, a comment that every time you do something in the application, then you must have a look if there's a hook for it and use it. Uh, one other hook that we thought would be uh, useful for you uh, to know about, and, uh, and also uh, the uh, associated uh, function, is, uh, is actually an example that we're shipping with, is the do watch folder function. So if you look at what is happening here, is uh, basically we're look, having a look if on disk you have a var temp watch folder. So this is something you can modify if you want to. Then we, we look in the application if there's a destination library that is called watch folder. And we then, add, we then inspect the watch folder uh, on disk, directory on disk, to see if there's something uh, that was added there. And we are using the flame schedule idle event, okay? And what is happening is that every time that uh, flame goes in idle mode, so it means that you stop, for example, moving the mouse, the action is, is run and the clip will be automatically imported. Uh, and we are running that using a hook. So there's a hook that is app initialized. So every time you start the application, it is being initialized. And in that case, we only call the do watch folder function. So for a little demo, I will actually move this like here. So you see that I have my do watch folder here. We're gonna go to my do watch folder and we're gonna make a copy of clip one. And in my watch folder here, when flame is idle, you will actually see that the, the, the clip will, uh, will, uh, will appear. Will, uh, will appear, yeah. Drum roll. So it's, yeah, that, okay. Uh, obviously it, it was working for- uh, This is for what we call a the, live the various, uh, like like the, yeah. This is just like but it's just that group. sometimes the sometimes the sometimes the idle time can be a, a little bit uh, longer, but mm -hmm. it should definitely uh, appear. So if you try that uh, uh, on your what side, period? Uh, maybe was, an, was there maybe? an extra period in the file name? Like did it go in? Oh, well, I guess it didn't give you an error. I guess it didn't give you an error. So no, that 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 should uh, that should be that should be good. What I can quickly show you is uh, for example here so um, so this is this is the uh, python uh, subfolder uh, i was talking about so you see that by default you have all the different uh, hook files that are there and there's the uh, watch folder so you can have actually files uh, multiple files that are calling the same hook uh, they, they need to be in one of the, the location that, uh, that we are using by default for sure. So if you go uh, by default to uh, Python examples, so you, you're gonna have a bunch of different examples there, including the watch folder, but those won't be called by the application. They really need to be into the .python to uh, mm -hmm. actually be used in the application. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, if we go here, some of the resources, uh, as Andy said, on the, on the internet, of course, on the web, you have a lot of different uh, resources, examples. Uh, one of the main one is just python.org. Uh, it's going to refer you to a lot of tutorials, to a lot of documentation. So that's a good entry point to actually 
have a look at. Uh, there are also the examples that I just mentioned that you can actually have a look at. It gives you some idea. It's well documented. Uh, if you think that it could be documented uh, even more, just let us know. And finally, if you go online on the Flame User Guide and in, in uh, the What's New, uh, there's always documentation about it. So if you go to the uh, API documentation section, there's something about the Python API. The output of the ELB is there and is uh, accessible online. Obviously, the advantage of uh, running it from the console is that, you, as I said, you get the live feedback on what, uh, what's not working. Uh, but uh, it's available online as well. All right. You know, I uh, just going back to the um, the the hook for uh, expo for write file. You know, we have at Lively, we are fortunate enough. We have a, a very robust infrastructure. We have a big SAN that we uh, have uh, take advantage of, and um, we're able to use a write file for like all of our pre comps, all of the steps in between. You know. Um, that uh, and we were always using write file to uh, export out like a pre-render. Why take up space on the stone? You know, why add uh, extra stuff to the daily archives? Why have that media duplicated and triplicated across all of our machines when batch groups are copied? And so when uh, when when this hook came out, we were able to have the same functionality with write file that we do with render notes. So you go ahead and hit a write file, and then uh, you know your image sequence is written to the SAN or written to disk. A link is automatically brought back in, no space is taken on the stone, and it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I know from my version, what I ended up doing was adding to that hook one, one more little command that would uh, take the render and instead of putting it underneath the right file node, it would put it to the right of the right file node because, you know, crazy. But uh, just to show you that, you know, you can customize these things to be anything that you want. Um, all right. I do have a question here from Kiego. Uh, um, Fred, let me, can, maybe we can, we can answer this one real quick. Um, he says, is there a simple way to import image sequences using the API? Currently, you have to manually enter the frame numbers in brackets, like in the code below. Um, wondering if there's already a tool somewhere that can detect image sequence patterns. The, of course, there's a there's a, a bunch of things that you can do with uh, with Python to uh, automate that. Uh, if you are only using the import clips function, for example, it might be uh, very well very well possible that by default it requires to get to pass the uh, the the frames that you want to do. But for sure, uh, you can you can modify it so that by default you auto detect all the different uh, frames that are uh, that are in a sequence and that you just use the 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 the, the all the sequence entirely by default this is uh, something that can be done for sure all right cool um thank you fred uh let's take a look at a script i'm going to share my screen again all right and let's go in here to um this uh, script that I have here for creating that import library, okay? So I have here um, uh, my uh, import flame, right? So this is what creates that library that has three folders in it, okay? In, uh, design, audio, and CG. So let's say we wanted to modify that to uh, make whatever you wanted. So you can see here, right? The first command we have is import flame which uh, goes ahead and, and gives you access to the Flame API commands. And then, uh, just like Fred uh, was describing, everybody can see this, right? Yes. Uh, okay, good. Just like Fred uh, described in, in, uh, in his presentation here, I wanna make a new library, okay? So I declare a variable first called new library, all right? It's, I'm a very creative person. So my new library is called new library, and that equals, flame.project.current underscore project.current underscore workspace dot create library. Okay. It's a very long command, <laughs> but you can save these all like in a text file, right? Uh, as a list of shortcuts and copy and paste them. And, and uh, that way you only have to do it once. 
And here I'm going to create a new library called import. All right. And then I'm going to create some folders in there. So my next command is uh, called design folder. And the command for that is design folder or the variable design folder equals new library, which is this dot create folder. So this is how you create a folder inside a library. And it happens to be called design. All right. And the same thing with audio and CG. All right. And then here we have a, a slightly different version of the, the, <laughs> the bracket hell at the bottom. But um, what this says here is um, uh, I have here uh, uh, um, in my contextual menu, I want to have a group called library, a group called custom library. And then uh, I wanted to show a, a label called create import library and then run main window, which is this, the name of the script here. Okay. So if I toggle back to flame and again, this is saved in opt Autodesk shared Python. I have my stuff organized into subfolders, but as long as it's in there, that's all you need. Um, let's go ahead and actually take a look at this in flame one more time. Okay. I'll delete the old one. All right. So if I click here and go to custom library, I see create import library and it creates the import library for me, right? Well, let's go ahead and modify that and see what happens. Let's say uh, you want to call this, you know, import stuff, okay? And you wanted to add a fourth folder. You can just copy and paste. Whoops, I said copy and paste with a new line and we'll call this uh, work picture folder, right? I'm going to go ahead and save just the uh, command S, right? Go back into flame and right click on my library and go to custom library. And you see it, it only says create import library. It doesn't say create import. I'm sorry, create import library. And down here, uh, it's, it's still showing the old stuff. It doesn't say import stuff. I don't have the fourth folder. And that's because if you change a script, if you add a script to that folder or change a script that's in that folder, you have to rescan your Python hooks in order for it to update uh, the scripts, which is accessible here in the flame menu or with uh, the keyboard shortcut, uh, control shift H and P. So when I rescan the Python hooks and try to run this one more time, Right, it now says the right thing, import stuff, and it reflects the changes that I've made. Uh, that's definitely something to remember. Any change that you make, you have to, you have to uh, refresh the hooks or else you're not gonna see the change. And okay. this is where, if I may, uh, Andy, uh, mm -hmm. this is where like it's really useful to start from the, uh, from the, uh, the console because, uh, or in the shell, because if you rescan the Python notes and there's an error in your file, this is where you're, you're gonna get the information. Ah. One of the one of the very very common error uh, with a Python is the indentation. Uh, Python is really really picky about the indentation and the white space at the end of the line, so it might prevent one of your script to work. So this is something to be uh, on the lookout for for sure. Definitely, and uh, we just watched um, last week the uh, Silicon Valley episode where. Uh, Richard broke up with his girlfriend because she preferred tabs to spaces. And so I, I had a whole, you know, I was the only one in my family that was laughing basically um, because I've been burned by this so many times, but uh, let's, let's put that to the test here. You can see uh, in my list of, of, uh, of folders, if I were to go ahead and, you know, add some more, or I, this was my new, this was my new line. If I were to go ahead and not indent it and save and rescan the hooks, doo -doo -doo. Right, I actually heard the error <laughs> in my headphones here. Um, but if I go back to the terminal, you can see here um, that uh, that hook did not, or that uh, script produced an error and it's telling me that it's in line seven, okay? So if I were to go back, sometimes it tells you that the, uh, it's not, the indentation is not correct. Maybe if I were to go that way, it'll tell me that, let's see. Yes, here we go. 
indentation error, error on line seven, unexpected indentation. I tell you, I have about 35 of these a day. So that's just showing you here that the indentation was not correct. So yeah, to Fred's point, definitely have uh, launched the app through the console. Otherwise you'd get no feedback uh, here, letting you know what's going on. Um, and you'll just end up spouting profanities on the train like uh, uh, I do whenever I'm doing my programming, my Python scripting. So um, let's look at one more and that is the shared library. Okay, I showed you that example here. Okay, uh, similar in, uh, in layout, except there's an, uh, an interesting little addition here, right? There's, um, we're importing in addition to Flame as a, a module, and Fred, please feel free to jump in and back me up on this. We're importing some other modules. Uh, one is OS, which gives you more um, commands to the OS, but also um, we're adding uh, PySide 2 and Qt widgets, which uh, allow you to do things like have pop-up windows and dialog boxes to add information or a dialog box that will show you a, a path, uh, like a, 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 a path on your file system somewhere. Um, so here we're, uh, creating a variable called DLG, which is short for dialogue, which launches this QT widgets, uh, Q input dialogue, which basically launches a dialogue box, okay? And then says here, um, has, with a, has a, a label text which says, enter the artist name, okay? And then an if command, uh, which I think means if this exists, <laughs> run it with this value. Um, and so, uh, and then it creates one by default rather, or uh, by in the process, it creates one more variable called name, which is a string of whatever it is you uh, entered. And now we get to flame, okay? So this was kind of like the QT widgets part of the Python script. And here is the flame part of the Python script. So I have a new variable called shared, which creates a shared library, as you can see here, create shared library. And the shared library, rather than being named uh, like, with something specific or something baked in like import or design or whatever. It's using the value of name. It's using the value of whatever you typed into the dialog box here, okay? And then uh, shared uh, is the object and then here are the attributes. So um, I can go ahead after creating this, I can automatically set, set it to acquire exclusive access so no one else can write into it. Um, I can then go and create folders inside of it and the folders I'm going to create are called from underscore plus name and to underscore plus name. And note the quotes. The quotes allow me to enter in a string of characters. And then um, the plus name just adds whatever it is we typed in the dialog box. And then I have another command here to release the exclusive access. Okay. So it's basically like create the shared library, which normally starts locked. All right. And then uh, create two subfolders in there and then uh, lock it again. All right, and that's what we get with create shared library. Let me show you that one more time. All right. And you get two friend and from friend. Whoops, I say you get two friend and from friend. And these are great scripts because uh, there, there's one, um, you know, this is one of the first ones that, uh, that Fred helped me out with. And from this, I, I learned like, oh, oh, okay. If I ever need a dialogue box for anything, this is all that I need to know. I just, excuse me, I copy these, uh, these little bits of information here and I can paste that into a new script and I'm off and running. I think, do I have, I think I might even have one more I can show you uh, that kind of showed the evolution of that. Yes, here, create TVC delivery, all right? Every time we deliver a spot at Lively, we put it in its own real group, okay? So let me show you create TVC delivery, which once I learned how to create something and create and give it a name, um, I ran with that a little bit of knowledge. So I have here, da, da, da. here we go. This is actually a script that has a bunch of, uh, of uh, of different defines, a, a bunch of different like scripts embedded within it. Here's the one to create the batch group, all right? And then here I have one called create TVC delivery. And here's that same little command, right? Quick QT widgets, there's the dialogue with some label text and then whatever you put in becomes the name. So then I created a new variable called real group. 
which uh, equals what you need to know from the Flame <laughs> Python API to create a real group, which is Flame Project Current Project dot Current Workspace dot Desktop dot Create Real Group using the name that was entered into the dialog box, right? And then here I set the real group color. There's that tuple that Fred was talking about. These are the RGB values. Um, these are the different reels that I wanted in my uh, in my real group. Each one has its name predefined. And then, uh, you know, the one thing I couldn't figure out how to do was uh, I didn't need the reel called sequences that is uh, that you get for free with a real group. So this goes in and says for reels in the real group dot reels. If you see a reel that's called sequences, go ahead and delete it. Okay. So again, here, if I go ahead and say new real group, you can see by default, you get, you know, your four reels and then you get sequences. I went ahead and did uh, desktop, create TVC delivery. And now I get a dialogue that asks me for either the name of the spot or the I add ID is key code. I type that, whoops, I type that in. And then you can see here, I get a real group that has the name of the ISCII code. I get the reels that I want name. It went and deleted the sequences reel and um, it uh, makes the real group uh, gold because gold. Um, but there, I just wanted you all to see the uh, evolution of like, you know, you take one little, you take one little uh, piece of uh, code you learn for one script or, or you learned in an example and you can easily apply it to other things. Um, Let's just look back here at the script one more time because I want, and Fred, I'm gonna need you to help me out with this here. Um, one of the things you can do with the Python API is define scopes, all right? And scopes mean like uh, you can have a script that, uh, that there are certain scripts that only really are applicable in batch. You don't need to see those when you're trying to do something that's only a library function, okay? So at the top of each script, you can uh, define a scope. And you can see here, like these are all things that can only be done in the desktop. So um, I have here uh, define scope desktop selection and then uh, import flame. And then for all things in the selection, if they could possibly exist in what uh, we call a Pi desktop or a desktop object, then fine, this is a desktop. Andy, you, Andy, you have right clicked on the desktop, so I, I will, show these functions below or these scripts below. Did I get that? Did I get that right? Or yeah, but the, that too the, this is one of the difference, for example, using the Python console and the, uh, the custom action like, uh, like you do, because in the function called from a custom action, we are actually always returning the selection by default, where in the console, you wouldn't get that. So in that case, you, you are right in the saying that uh, this uh, this little function there is saying, look if the selection is a Pi desktop. If it is, return true. True. If it's not, return false. And then at the end of your script, and the, when you return the structure that builds the contextual menu, then we you can add your scope. And this is where you would say, uh, only display that function or that custom action on a desktop. Mm -hmm. I got you. And you and right, that's not uh, built into the Python console. It has no way of knowing where where you are when you're um, when you're running the script. Correct. That's correct. You can always like pass the selection the selected entries, for example, of the media panel, but you couldn't scope it like you, like you, this in the same way that you just showed in the uh, in the for the custom action. Gotcha. Cool. Um, hold on. Andy Davis has a question here. So after you imported Flame, you then imported OS for PySide. Could you instead use something else like HOU to import uh, Houdini Python calls within Flame? I know this won't do anything um, complex, but could it pass variables and data? Ooh. Obviously, what you need to be able, like uh, Flame needs to be able to understand the command that you are passing right so the answer might be yes to your question and the uh, we haven't tried that so maybe the what the um, what the what you get into the module 
from Houdini are just a bunch of comments that are open and are accessible and are um, are affecting, let's say, files on disk or things like that that you that we could access. But uh, for example, you couldn't go in Houdini, import Flame, and use comments like uh, create batch group or st stuff like that because it would refer to code that Houdini doesn't understand, right? So it might be the it might be true uh, in the example that you you are you are asking about. Uh, and then also just, I guess, uh, one other thing, the import OS wasn't really used in, uh, like here in, in create, uh, in create real group. Um, I guess this is a, a holdover from my, my beginning days. Yeah. Where I was like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is what I got from one example and so, it didn't not work. So let me put it in everything. Um, but later so, on sometimes here, you try something, you try something and then you, you, you do not use it because you use it from a, a different way, but you forget to, uh, to, uh, remove some parts. Exactly. And like, if it ain't broke. Right. Um, so yeah, I also, I have a script in here that, um, Admittedly, will probably not work on on my uh, Mac here because I I borrowed this from from uh, my office. But um, let's see. But that creates. No, it's not going to work. That's fine. But it, it creates a folder structure on uh, on our SAN for uh, like creating. Um, whenever we deliver a spot, there are a series of subfolders. So in that case, OS would be useful there. Um, I thought it would be helpful to show off or to show everybody rather, uh, a couple of things in the console here in batch, okay? Uh, just some, some, some basic things um, to get you started. So yeah, right, let's say we wanted to create a node, all right? Like if we wanted to create a mux node, right? We start with import flame, okay? And then the command to create a, a node is flame.batch.create underscore node. And then in parentheses, we put what kind of node we want. In this case, we want to create a MUX node. Whoops, I missed the quote there. So if I go ahead and hit play, hey, there's a MUX node, okay? Very exciting. Um, but I could also uh, borrow from my little notes and shortcuts uh, text file here. I have somewhere. Well, I'll just type it out, All right? I can always do this. I could do create equals flame.batch.create node. And so now I could just type this for all the nodes I wanna create. I could just type create. And if I hit play, I get the mux node, All right, A lot easier to type, but uh, let's, do this. Let's call, let's uh, start with defining a variable called new mux. All right. So new mux equals create mux. And I'm going to get the same result, except now I have a variable called new mux. All right. Let's go ahead and have some more fun with that by adjusting the attributes. So if I do new mux.name equals I am a mux. Okay then you're gonna get a mux node with that label as a name, right? Um, which is great, we're gonna create a mux node, but then um, another very, very useful command here are the position commands, all right? Like if you want that mux, by, but by default a node is just created at zero, zero, like in the middle of your schematic, okay? Um, but let's say I wanted to create a second mux node, all right? Called second mux equals Create, I'm big into mux nodes. Um, second mux dot name equals, second mux. And then we can uh, define where we want it to go in, um, in the schematic here, okay? Um, so we could do like second mux dot position X or POS underscore X equals new mux, which is our first one, dot position underscore X plus 300. 
And so now if I go ahead and press play, it'll show me that I screwed that up. What did I screw up here? Yada dee. And second box. Really? Fred, I'm not seeing it. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh... Oh, you can't start the name of the number. Let's try that. All right, so I'm just going to copy this and paste it here and here. Let's see if that. Yay, there we go. Thank you so much. Tim Farrell for the win. All right. <laughs> which is great. And um, one last thing is if you wanted to connect these, right? You type our connect command. And you'd start off with uh, your from, which is new mux, and the output of it, which is default, right, Fred? Uh, yes. Is it result, okay. And then, um, but for that, you haven't specified connect, so you'll go to, you'll oh, need to write the, you. the, the, uh, the old, uh, the old you command. You just denied me the opportunity to swear. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> Input, <laughs> let me go back and do that. Zero. Okay, so I'm gonna just gonna define another here. So connect equals flame.batch.connect nodes, right? All right, so I'll clear these. And it didn't work. Oh, that's because new mux needs to be all caps here. There we go. So if I hit play, now you have created two nodes and you've created a connection. All right. So just uh, simple examples of how you could uh, you could play around here in the um, in the console to create nodes, to label them, to move them, and uh, and to connect them. And so when I made that whole big giant set up here. I first did a layout of the setup that I, I like or that I wanted, like the result I wanted. And then I went ahead and built it with those commands. And yes, it would be like radically inefficient to do that every time you were going to make a, make a batch graph. But if you need to make the same thing 20 times, four times a day, taking the time to do it once uh, is extremely time saving. I think you just show like, oh. you just show what's the, the console is useful for, right? You're trying to build something, maybe something that you, you want to repeat often. So you're using the console to try it. And once you have actually what you were looking for, then you can convert that into a custom action and put it mm -hmm. in a file. And then it, you got your, uh, your custom action in your, your IT. Right. That's actually but to debug and get the errors and things like that. Using the console is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yep, you mess around in here until you got what you want that you can copy and paste it into a file. Yeah. And now you have it as a Python file. Let's, uh, let's just bounce over and see what uh, questions we have here. There are a couple more in the Q&A from Chris. Chris says, I found a number of my Python scripts don't show up in the hotkey editor. Is there a reason why that happens? Uh, that uh, I would be curious to, to know if the, the scripts actually actually show uh, in the contextual menus, uh, because it might be that there was an error, and if there's an error, the, the script won't be loaded in Flame. So there might be uh, an error being returned, and you might not see it in the uh, in the shell. So maybe this is something, uh, Chris, that we can take offline and we can have a look at. Uh, otherwise, I've I've never heard of a uh, of a a script not showing in the uh, the shortcut editor so there might be a problem but i've never heard of that all right um barry says um can you can you i'm sorry one more from andy davis is it possible to use the flame python module to update versioned assets like a new fbx camera found on the server for example uh yes yeah you can uh out of the box uh, I don't think that we have something that monitor if, uh, if something uh, has changed, but this is certainly something like the pieces and the tools are there for you to do it. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, you would have, for example, a little bit like we did with the, uh, the watch folder example to actually watch if something uh, has been uh, changed on, on disk and then it could trigger an action and update it. 
Cool. Uh, Barry asks, do you, can you program a color transform with a certain LUT or ACE? Uh, I guess it's ACE's IDT, for example. Um, uh, no, right, right now, right now, there's no way to manipulate the uh, color space of a clip in the Flame Python API. Uh, Barry, I could show you. Um, I don't think I have it here at home, but I did. Uh, I did write a script. I was working on an episodic that had um, a CDL for each shot or a LUT for each shot. Oh, uh, so I wrote, oh yeah, okay, that, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, that's the, uh, that, I think that's that was the, the, way uh, it, the workaround I gave you. <laughs> yeah, that was the workaround. Um, what I was able, you can, you can add a color management node and you can load a color management setup for that node, okay? Uh, and so if you happen to know in advance, uh, like what, what LUT you need or, you know, what, what LUT you need, you could uh, make a color management setup file that has that, that setting already, uh, or that custom or whatever it is already uh, saved. And then you could uh, run a Python script that will add the color management node and preload it with that saved setup. So that is a workaround. And uh, I can show you that offline uh, if you want, just, just send me a message. Um, Jorge, uh, would it be possible using Python to send elements from an archive to Flame Archive so they are restored in the background? Is it, so is it, I guess, uh, Jorge, you're wondering, is there a way that you could, if you, to extract something from an archive using Python uh, and have it loaded in the background, maybe into another, pro like a non-active project or a, another workspace in that project? On, uh, honestly, about that, uh, Within the, the within Flame and within the Flame API, the answer would be no. But I'm not sure outside of it uh, if you can uh, do something about it. And uh, maybe this is something that uh, we could look at, uh, Jorge, and uh, get back to you about. Maybe there's something that can be done, but that would be outside of the Flame uh, Python API. Gotcha. Uh, and then uh, Tim Farrell is asking. Uh, any plans to simplify the process? I'm thinking of something like Photoshop Actions, which records your keystrokes and plays them back on command. So something where like you could build a batch setup that you like, for example, and then create a script out of that. Is there anything like that uh, that's possible? This is actually, this is actually I'm, something. I'm very fragile emotionally, Fred. And <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going to tell me that there is, I'm probably going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Andy, but there, there's something that we actually uh, tried uh, a long time ago. I think that I showed a prototype of that like at NAB 2006 or 2007, something like that. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we hit major roadblock uh, very, very fast uh, doing things like that. Uh, so maybe that this is something that we could revisit uh, in the future and see if like with newer technologies, uh, but there was like the problem was really more on the, the flame side uh, than anything else. So, um, so I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's, Right now, it's a doubtful that uh, you would see something like that in the short term. Gotcha. Um, let me show you guys two more things real quick. Um, just now that we've talked about the scripts a little bit. Um, the first one is in the, uh, the episodic exports script. I just want to show you um, maybe like but, the OS. Uh, Oh, yeah, Fred. Maybe just a, maybe one thing that I could quickly mention, and it is something that we, we've put in place last year, but uh, we didn't really have the time to actually uh, put it more into, uh, into effect. And uh, we, we, anyway, we wanted to give the time to, to people to actually uh, start looking into the Python API, but we want to put uh, in place a structure with, where it would be much more easier to uh, share uh, scripts and there are some people uh, out there like Michael, Stefan, and the who are sharing scripts uh, already. But um, so back to uh, Tim's point, uh, we want to make it uh, easier for people to uh, benefit from all of this without having uh, the, to go through the asshole themselves to build uh, build up some some of the the, the scripts like this. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Take care, Gonzalo. Um, and thank you. In the uh, episodic export script here, now that we looked at a couple of things here, I just wanted to, to point out um, all that this does, this, this, this uh, script here utilizes the flame export hook, okay? Um, which is the, called a uh, exporter here, Pi exporter. And so uh, I have two, and I, I shared this back uh, with our first Logic Live. I'm, I'm happy to share it again uh, for this one here, but all that this does is um, you right click on a, uh, you right click on the clip, whatever clip is selected, it's gonna export it using uh, whatever the defined export presets are. And these are just like export presets. Like we've all made a million of these, I'm sure. But when you go to export, you can create a preset. So you create your preset here, save it and uh, with, with whatever you want, and then put the path to that preset here, okay? And so when I go ahead and click export, like I showed at the beginning of this, it's exporting, it's, uh, exporting that clip twice um, with each one of these presets. So it goes out twice, but I also have a version here in my script called manual. All right. Which will uh, using that, that OS uh, module will go ahead and allow you to manually select the path. All right. And this is just another example of that dialogue box here. So if you go to exports and manual, a window opens up. I have like a predefined area for it here. I mean, you can put it like, you know, if you always export to one folder, you can put that in there, but this allows you to pick the folder that you want and export to that folder there. Except of course, Andy didn't test this before he went ahead. <laughs> and of course he picked the 30 second spot. So we're just gonna stop that. But anyway, I wanted you to see uh, that there. And then um, the, the setup that I have that creates or the script rather that I have that creates this kind of default set up um there's a bunch of stuff in here but when you break it down there's really not you know i mean all that it does is make sure that uh i'm working in a batch group it goes and looks for all the proper real names right so if it finds a real called schematic real one like if i didn't name them ahead of time it will change the names okay um and then you can see here for everything i'm like defining a clip and giving it a position, right? Uh, I'm defining, I'm creating a MUX node here, giving it a name and giving it a position based on the original source clip node and so on and so on and so on and so on. Um, when I create the paint node for doing my red pens, there's a command called load node setup, which allows you to load a setup. This is how I load a paint setup that has my colors predefined. Or if you have uh, like a color management node, anything, um, if there's a, a setup that you always load, if there's something like down here in the user bin that you always use, uh, that's another way to grab, to grab that. And then uh, at the bottom here, I define all the connections, connect this to that and this to that and so on and so on. And then I have a, uh, you know, bracket hell down here <laughs> that uh, where you can define the name of the script. So that was a, a hopefully an informative little overview of the kind of things you can do with the Python API. Um, oh, Andy David says one more. Can Python create setups that include linked expressions? Um, um, I don't know that th that's, a, that's a good question. I've, I've never tried it. Uh, the, the linked expression should be part of the, the setup itself. So the answer, uh, I guess, would be yes, because there is a save setup, save a node setup function. Uh, in batch, so there's a you can save a batch setup or a individual node setup. So if the linked expressions are saved into those setups, then when you reload them, they should be reloaded. Um, but if you if you were trying to create it live, like if you had a, a, if you were doing what I'm doing here and you wanted to create a setup, you, there is no specific Python command to create a linked. Um, no. No, expression. that's correct. You, you can do a node link. You can, you know, one of one of these. Whoops, I mean one of these. I mean one of these. But oh, there's no, there's no like yeah. expression wise a copy link. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct. That's not in the Python API. Cool. Well, let's. Uh, I want to say thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. This is a lot of fun. Uh, I hope I, I hope thank you and this was great for everybody. If anyone has any questions about it. Uh, about Python in general, please feel free to reach out. 
Um, let me just bring back the old, uh, um, what do you call it, keynote thingy, which I have here somewhere, and we'll wrap this up. Um, we have some upcoming Logic Live sessions I wanna tell you guys about. First of all, tonight uh, at 6 p.m., uh, we're doing a neat video deep dive with Tim from Neat Video, and there's going to be a, um, uh, an exclusive discount code for everybody who tunes in. Uh, neat Video, as everybody knows, is the greatest you know, noise reduction tool in the world, um, but uh, I, I certainly can put my hand up. I'm only using the barest uh, minimum of its functionality, and uh, I know when Tim took me through everything that it can do, uh, there's so much more available, and so please tune in. It's going to be great. Next Sunday, we're going to do an interview with Will Harris, Flame Family Product Manager, followed by Maya for Flame Artists with Yuri Tampolsky from Sao Paulo on May 24th. Uh, Connected Conforms for Social Deliverables with Brian Bailey. I just had to do this, uh, or we just had to do this uh, last week, and it's a nightmare. And so anything we can do to simplify that is going to be much appreciated. And June 7th, we're going to do Silhouette Paint with our friends at Forest Effects. And June 14th, Resolve for Flame Artists with David Johns, who's a great, great, great guy out in LA. Um, you can uh, find all kinds of great content on logic.tv, our website, including uh, my Matchbox and Python resources, all right? Um, there is, uh, oh, you know, I'm gonna actually stop this share and I just wanna give a shout out to, uh, to, to Michael, who I see is on here. Um, what did I save that? Here we go. Couple of things here. Um, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, Python scripts, definitely check out uh, pyflame.com, all right? This is Michael's uh, site where he's got some amazing Python scripts uh, that are very easy to install, even as an installer. But I can't tell you how many times uh, this one has saved my ass, the paint node edit, all right? Uh, how many times have you like had it set to single frame, but you wanted a sequence? Boom. I just recently found invert access. And uh, even today when I was preparing for the setup here, um, where did it go? Where did it go? Come on, replace render nodes, right? There's a bug that every now and then you go to render your batch node and, and go to render your batch and it says, uh, I can't, sorry, there's no render nodes, but there is a render node. Well, you run this script and it replaces the render nodes with exact replicas of what was there and you're good to go. So uh, a whole bunch of great stuff. You can also check out uh, Stefan's at flamepy.com. Um, the, uh, make sure you go to the uh, Flame documentation and to API here, right? And Python API, and you can check out here. These are all of the, Python API commands. Um, there are also examples here, uh, how to execute uh, scripts, how to run your, uh, writing your first Python scripts. This is how I got started. And a bunch of other great examples here, um, which, uh, you know, even if, if uh, you have something that isn't, uh, if you have an idea for a script and it's not expressly listed here as an example, I guarantee you you're gonna need to do one, one part of it you can find and one part leads to another part, leads to another part. So definitely check that out. Um, go back to the keynote. Uh, definitely uh, check out all the Logic Live episodes on Logic.tv. This one will be up as soon as I can get up there. Please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's uh, been doing great. We appreciate it. And of course, a huge thank you again to Synesis Oceana, our sponsor. Uh, Synesis provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. Find out more about their remote workflow solutions at synesis.io, supporting flame artists since 1997. So that's it, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all your support and for all the good wishes and everything. And uh, we'll see you all at 6 p.m. tonight for the neat video deep dive. Take care, everybody. <laughs>